Okay, keeping with this idea of geometric hard edge abstraction, keeping with this idea of uh, a kind of abstraction that is a purifying process that rids itself, reduces itself down to just the essence, the underlying essence is where the truth of things lies. Uh, we then made our next trip to Holland. Um, and we saw the Dutch neoplasticism or the shill of uh, Pierre Mondrian. So Mondrian, you have two ways of identifying his movement. To still the style. And it became very signature, right? The style that he develops based on um, the right angle, the grid structure, um, and the three primary colors. Uh, he also called it neoplasticism. Um, so he is, is coming up with a kind of language of st a structural language. You do away with subject matter, and you kind of replace subject matter with structural, with structural components. And the structural components speak about what he sees as the underlying order of nature. Um, that underlying drama as being a grid structure, uh, one that does speak that there is order underneath all the surface chaos. And that is quite a Quite a thing to come to when the world is at war, when he has his initial breakthrough. So hard edge geometric abstraction is one way to define what he's doing, but you still want to get the proper ism or movement connected to him, and that would be the still or neoplasticism. Now, um, I want you to distinguish his early work from his later work, because he hasn't quite really worked out his theory. He has to go on an evolution, a journey, and we start with the evolution triptych. An evolution from the natural studies, he studied naturalism in the academy, to the grid, you know, from nature to the grid. And for him, this is a one-way journey. For him, taking the abstraction, this idea of abstraction, complete abstraction as transcending the physical world of things, um, is, is really an idea that abstraction takes you to a higher plane. It takes you to a higher plane where you see the inner spiritual structure, again, that kind of cosmic structure, um, where you speak for him in universals, universal truths, not subjective personal truths, not, um, not self-expression. So he doesn't use the self-expressive gesture, but instead uh, he, is, he dedicated um, his uh, art, one of the magazines of Distill, to future man. So it's very future-oriented. It's very utopian, about a kind of utopian world that will be better ordered and that art maybe could play a part in helping to design a better ordered world. All right. Um, so the evolution triptych speaks almost of this kind of cosmic journey. We get a sort of androgynous woman, young girl turning into woman. Um, so we're not really focused on, on sexuality here in the least. It's not really the bride strip bear, is it? not about erotics, like uh, surrealism will be later. Instead, we see her in sort of three different states, uh, with red behind her, red symbolizing something that pulls you down to earth, and her nipples, her navel, pulling you down to um, downward, toward, toward the earthbound. But in the next uh, work, we see this light. Uh, the triangles all pull up. She has a vision with eyes wide open, so we have this sense of moving from nature to, um, to, in some sense, the spirit. Uh, but he doesn't just stop there with that binary of what pulls you down and what transcends and maybe lifts you higher. He gives us one third element where the triangles point both up and point down, and so do her nipples and her navel. And this is his belief that you have to find a way, in some sense, to negotiate uh, what he sees as the kind of cosmic blueprint of life, of nature. And he sees it all based on the vertical crossed with the horizontal. Now, you know, that does make a cross. But for him, this is about an intersection that one has to seek a balance for, an ordered balance. And it is not an easy ordered balance. And if it is too symmetrical, It'll just be static. And that'll never work with the dynamics, right, of the 20th century. So what he's seeking is a dynamic equilibrium. That's his term, dynamic equilibrium. 
a dynamic equilibrium between the forces that are arranged kind of on the vertical, the forces on the horizontal. And this is being sort of the, the code, uh, the DNA code of what underlies nature, what underlies life. So to break down that code for him, the vertical can also stand for the male, the horizontal for the female who lies down and takes it. So how to balance those. The vertical can stand for, um, in terms of the musical metaphor, the vertical stands for a kind of harmony, a harmony of the spheres. But the horizontal uh, is more the line of melody. So how do you do melody in, in that harmony? Um, in terms of space and time, uh, the vertical stands for something kind of eternal on the central axis, something more fixed, like in an icon of God. The horizontal is the place of coming and going. So the vertical is a sort of fixed spatial center, and the horizontal is time, like a timeline. Um, so you can see how he plays this out. Uh, again and again and sees that everything kind of reverberates through this balancing in a dynamic equilibrium way between the vertical and the horizontal. So it doesn't mean a simple symmetrical balance. It means um, you know, finding your balance in the 20th century world. So um, that's this idea of balancing those two forces. Now he comes to this during his mystical phase. This is early work. Remember he starts out in nature, naturalism. And then he gets involved with theosophy, with Rudolf Steiner's mystical exercises. And that was his first attempt to kind of move past surface appearances to some type of kind of um, cosmic, inner spiritual, uh, the inner mystical construction of the universe, the inner mystical construction of nature. Now, um, the next stage, you move from naturalism to this sort of mystical metaphysics of theosophy. The next stage for him is the discovery of Cubism. And we see as Cubism starts right around 1912, he's in Paris. Our Dutchman is in Paris. And he very quickly gravitates toward Cubism, toward letting go of the subject matter and focusing instead on structure as what carries the meaning. Structure. And he's, he's working his way toward that grid. So he starts with things that already lend themselves to a grid system. He thinks in systems, right? His whole painting is sort of systems of ways of working things out, series, rather than narratives, rather than storytelling. So do you see this difference between storytelling and subject matter and structures and systems? That's a big shift. Um, the tree seems like a, a grid system already. It has a vertical trunk and then branches that extend outward in a horizontal way. So he's gravitating toward things. He doesn't know he's going to end up with the grid yet. But he's gravitating toward things that suggest that grid structure. Uh, but this tree clearly shows the influence of cubism, the restricted palette, uh, the way we are um, dematerializing the solid tree into its structural components and working that uh, in the canvas. He has a few little curves that sort of suggest leaves. But those curves, it's starting to be a kind of mathematical language for getting at the structural nature of nature rather than describing it mimetically. And cubism helps him immensely. He will be the one who unfolds the cube and takes it all the way to complete abstraction. It's like he picks up where Picasso stops. Picasso doesn't go all the way to complete abstraction. And there's Mondrian on the scene to take it further. Um, so what you get here is his color planes and oval. He is starting to work out his system. He hasn't worked out the black bands that cut all the way across. He hasn't worked out the three primary colors, so he's still experimenting. And he hasn't figured out what to do with the corners where things kind of better out. So he's still thinking symbolically in terms of the Hindu egg, Buddhism, and the cycle of life that he sees as birth, life, death, and the deeper. So he still comes from all these sort of mystical ways of thinking about nature um, in ways different from just the mimetic approach. And then we reach this sort of 1915 mark, which is um, really this, this key term for us now, this first set of dates, 1915 to 20. There he has his breakthrough. 
That is where he works out what we call the plus and minus system, and the plus and minus system is the vertical and the horizontal. And it's um, where he also starts doing things like gridding an ocean. If you can grid an ocean, what can't you grid? Remember now, by 1915, 15, World War I has begun. It will last from 1914 to 18. So it has already begun. He has had to leave Paris, where he was so excited working with the avant-garde. He's back in Holland, and he is surrounded on all sides by trench warfare, a world at war. And yet, there is Mondrian thinking you can grid an ocean is underlying order to it. And this is how he sort of plots that scene. Uh, this is the same moment when Picasso has decided not to go to complete abstraction, but instead has gone the way of mixed media, has gone the way of collage. When he reached that point of complete abstraction with analytic cubism, he moves toward collage and mixing it up. Um, so that's a different direction. And you know, the history of art since then has been picking up on these different things. But Mondrian pushes to a more and more kind of minimalist, reductive uh, type of language. And these are the plus and minus images. Pure notion that was yellow and plus and minus is this. So now we get to composition in color A, 1917. It's still during the war years. This picture has a great pulse in how it moves. He still hasn't figured out his final mature language, but he will by 1921. So I want you to draw a line on your study guide. Draw that line under composition in color A, 1917, and over tableau two, which just means painting two, composition. Because everything above that line is his early work, 1915 to 21, or uh, to 20, and everything below that line, starting with this work in 1921, is his mature work that you should date between two world wars. Now the war is over, and uh, that's when he really figures out his language. And so you can date everything below the line is 1925 to 30. That would be fine. So um, at this point, he has learned to kind of extend the black bands. They aren't just contours for the blocks or outlines for the blocks. They are bands that cut through the space in vertical and horizontal ways. He has taken his um, color and stopped being hesitant or pastel about it and reduced it to the three primary colors. Uh, he is painting very much on the flat plane. Remember, this is someone who does away with the idea of the painting as a window extension of space. So he doesn't have put a picture frame, a Rococo picture frame around a Mondrian. That will not work, right? Um, so he mounts it. He really paints on a flat board. Um, and then mounts it on another board. So you really see it as a painting on the wall and not a painting as a kind of illusionistic penetration through the wall. That's really different. That's a really different way to window view through the wall. Instead, it, it just won't function as a window. He cuts that off. So that's a big thing that he gives us. In terms of his context, let's remember, he's Dutch, and Holland is already a grid. Nature is a grid in Holland. It's the flat lowlands cut by canals. So in some sense, the topography of Holland matches a grid system. And what that grid suggests is a kind of control of the human mind over nature. That you can control it, you can plot it, you can, you can put canals through it and, you know, arrange it and order it. So there's something in that. Now, also from, uh, from Holland, he's part of the Protestant uh, kind of movement um, that was iconoclastic, that did not believe in trying to render something as abstract and sacred as God, did not feel you could represent um, God through a human figure, that that would be a kind of improper reduction. So the iconoclasts uh, thought that all of those representations of God, those beautiful representations that the Catholic Church was giving us in Italy, uh, were idolatry. So they have always believed in a kind of strong sense of the abstract nature of, of um, deep kinds of truths, abstract truths. So there is a way in which his work is kind of iconoclast and does way with figuration. Um, does away, remember, with so much, he won't really use any other colors besides his three primaries. So there's a sense of kind of um, a stripping down in that way. 
and it leads to what we call the Schoon uh, principle, S-C-H-O-O-N, I think, the Schoon aesthetic. And remember, that is the word in Dutch. I'm not pronouncing it right, but if I did, you know, you recognize how to spell it. S-C-H-O-O-N. It is the as idea that cleanliness is kind of next to godliness. So cleanliness and purity and beauty are all interwoven, and they all go by that one word. So that one word, when you unpack it, is, is their idea of beauty, and that means beauty is clean and pure. So it's this kind of reductive approach. Um, there's no personal brush stroke shown, and that's what kind of gives it more of a sort of a universal address um, in its approach. It's not about self-expression. It's very different in nature um, to that. And it has a kind of utopian push toward a world that can be designed in this more orderly way, and to, to prove that, he lived it. He lived the neoplastic philosophy, and his studio was designed around it. So partition walls that could be rearranged, reordered in different ways, um, and there he is at home, so relaxed in the studio, which looks like a schoon um, aesthetic. Now, his, his mature work, we recognize it, we recognize it instantly, um, we looked a lot at the one on the left, um, composition with red, blue, and yellow. They're almost all called that. And they, it's amazing once he finds this mature language, how he never really repeats himself with it, how he finds it um, really expandable and he can take it in a lot of different directions. Um, this work requires, by the way, a clean white space to hang it in, does it not? It's the beginnings of the modern art gallery as a white cube space, because that's where you can imagine the extension of these black lines coming through uh, on the wall. As we go forward in time, he seems to know the language so well he can make it more complex. Just like Malievich took it down the black square and then his geometry gets progressively more complex, so too, like look at this blue that's not outlined, look at the um, ex extra levels of lines. So the work gets Kind of increasingly complex, but basically still working that same dialogue in 1925 to 1930 works perfectly for this mature work. And then finally, we get Broadway Boogie Boogie. This is a late work. You just call it late. 1925 to 30 would be okay if you remembered. Since you can remember, it's late. It's late in the course. So put anything really late in the course that you know dates from late in the course, date 1940 to 1945. So that's Broadway Boogie Boogie where. The pulse really picks up once again because the black bands aren't even there. Everything becomes this kind of energy system. And remember, boogie woogie jazz is this attempt to create dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium. And to think about how the horizontal and the vertical intersect, um, how the idea of melody and harmony can intersect again, how you can find that balance. All right, these are hard-won paintings, remember. Lots of adjustments to find the proportions that will uh, yield dynamic equilibrium. Not as easy as some people seem to think they are. <coughs>